Welcome to Whispering Loudly, the award-winning workshop whisperer podcast as featured by Apple with Rachel Evans, the number one automotive business coach in the aftermarket. Thanks to titanium sponsor, Mechanic Desk and gold sponsor, Podium. Welcome to Performance Hub with Dean Evans. Performance Hub is a series of podcasts we are going to be doing with Coach Dean Evans. The first one is today. Hello, Dean. Hi, Mel. Thanks for having us on the podcast. Pleasure. Hey, Dean. Wonderful to have you here in the studio for the first time ever. COVID has meant that uh, the previous podcast we've done with you, you have been locked inside South Australia, but uh, Open Borders see us together at our little podcast studio here in Newcastle. So welcome. Thank you. It's uh, great to be here. Fantastic setup. Now, Dean, we have had such uh, a fabulous response to the uh, episodes that we've already done together, looking a little more at uh, personal performance rather than business performance, uh, because we know that your business business can't be optimal unless you yourself as the owner are optimal. So we wanted to do a little series for this season, which we're calling uh, Performance Hub. And today you're going to give everyone out there some tips on how to overcome being a workaholic, which we know with our clients that we chat to every day is a huge problem. So I know that uh, if you're out there listening, you're probably thinking, well, what do you actually mean when you say workaholic? So what are we talking about there? Yeah, well, when we talk about a workaholic, and I say this as a recovering workaholic myself, um, coming from a background where I could easily get lost in work and and literally find things to do and uh, and, make it incredibly difficult to uh, to take myself away from work. When we're talking about uh, a workaholic or a workaholism, it fits under the label of addictive behaviours, right? So any addictive behaviour uh, must meet one of three criteria, okay? It must meet a need for certainty, must meet a need for variety, it must meet a need for connection, and it must meet a need for significance. And if three of those uh, four needs are, are met, then it's going to produce an addictive behaviour. And when we talk about uh, um, workaholics, workaholism, it is a habitual behaviour that will keep you focused on one particular thing or searching for ways to continue to engage yourself in one particular uh, arena or avenue to the detriment of almost everything else. So when we describe workalism, it's an addictive behaviour. Okay. And for you listening out there, you likely know a workaholic or are one yourself. It's that person who leaves for work uh, early in the morning before the family gets up and they are perhaps not home before the family goes to bed again. And even though you may have the best laid plans uh, for the family to sit down for dinner, uh, for the your other half to, uh, you know, tuck the kids into bed at night, night after night, something is always going down and that person stays at work. Yeah. Well, there's, there's just as you were saying, that one um, very clear example just sprang to mind. That is, in most cases, if you want to, uh, you know, if you want to find a workaholic, go look in the mirror. That's probably the first one uh, that you're gonna that you're gonna find. But here's the sign, and this is the one that's probably going to hit you right in the heart. Um, in most cases, you'll know you're a workaholic because you will do more for your customers than you will for your kids. Or your family. You know, you will stay behind to fix another car because that job's got to get on and you have got to get out. And you will do that um, as a priority over being home for dinner, for bath time, for bedtime, like you said you would. And again, I say that as a recovering workaholic myself. You just find a reason. So your family becomes, uh, you know, the value of family becomes a concept. The reality is you will prioritize one more job, one more task, uh, you know, one more tune up over that time that you promised with your family, with your kid. And that brings in a whole other set of um, circumstances uh, in terms of, you know, conflict at home. You might not necessarily think that you are... Uh, choosing the customer though yourself would you because in your mind you think everything you're doing is for the family yeah and we'll touch on that as we go through you know the five-step recovery process Um, but absolutely um, your brain uh, will you create a belief by um, engaging in this behavior over and over and over again that you're doing this for the family that this is all you know for the greater good and 
in a sense, it is, of course, because in most cases, the workaholic is is the male mm-hmm. of the family. I understand that's a generalist statement. And, and again, I don't want anyone to, to you know, misunderstand or misrepresent what I'm saying. In most cases, it's it's the male. And certainly in, in this industry, mm-hmm. automotive industry, uh, it tends to be the case. So by, by engaging in that behavior over and over again, you create the belief that what you're doing is for the good. So yes, you're providing. Um, yes, you're putting food on the table. Uh, you know, you're, you're paying for the mortgage, paying for the rent, doing whatever you're doing. But as we uh, look through these five steps, the perspective that you have versus the perspective that the people closest to you have uh, are often at odds with each other. Okay. Well, let's get to the five steps. A five-step process uh, to recovery from being a workaholic. What's step one? Yeah. So step one, like any addictive behavior, the path to recovery reveals itself once you have accepted and admitted that you've got a problem. And so if you ever want to begin the journey to recovery as a workaholic, then number one is you need to accept the facts and admit that you are, in fact, a workaholic. Nothing else Um, can occur or will occur until you've got to that point where you are willing and able to raise your hand, put your hand on your heart and say, hey, I'm a workaholic. I I devote more of myself to work than I do to any other pursuit in life. It has to begin there. And, you know, it may sound a little funny um, that we're, we're talking about something called workaholic, but this is a deadly serious thing, right? This, this breaks up marriages. It, (laughs) Um, you know, it puts strain on relationships. Yeah, it uh, it uh, it breaks up marriages. It puts strains on relationship. In its, I guess it, its most destructive form, it actually ends lives. Mm-hmm. There is a condition, uh, and the name of it escapes me now, but a condition where um, certain professionals expect that they will die at their desk. Mm. They understand that work is their life and that's where life is going to end at their desk. And I don't know about you, but that doesn't seem like much of a life for me. No, I would agree with that. Avoid mistakes others are making and take your auto repair shop to the next level. To reach out, email admin at workshopwhisperer.com with the subject Workshop Whispers and we'll answer your question in our next Workshop Whispers episode. What's step two in the recovery process? Yeah, so step two is about you need to pre-fill your time. What do I mean by that? Um, from having you know a similar conversation with you know, hundreds, if not thousands of auto repair shop owners, the biggest or the most common reason why those individuals stay at work is because they have not taken any time to think about what they would do with the time available outside of work. Mm. So what's step two? You've got to pre-fill time. It really is thinking about you know your bucket list. What would you do in your wildest dreams with the time that you had available to you, or rather the time that you made available to you if you chose not to spend all that time at work. And that's a classic one uh, with our engine room clients, isn't it? When we're helping them set up a four-day work week, the initial resistance to that can be from them because they have no idea what they would do on that fifth day when they would otherwise be at work. They uh, have not allowed themselves to have hobbies, to have time for self-care, uh, for catching up with family. They literally have excluded all of that from their lives. Yeah, yeah. They just haven't taken a moment to consider what they could be doing. They do the only thing they know how to do, and in most cases know that they're good at doing, which is work. Yeah. So that's what they do. What's step three? Step three is fantastic, right? So step three is, um, like any detective, you've actually got to review the evidence, right? Every behavior is a learned strategy. Uh, and so an individual that is um, so deeply driven to work learnt that behavior, that work ethic, that attitude, that approach to what they do from someone else when they were growing up. So consider who were your uh, role models, who were the major influences uh, in your life, often before the ages of uh, 12, uh, in many cases before the ages of seven. So mum, dad, aunties, uncles, teachers, um, you know, people that you looked up to and were a significant influence uh, on your 
attitude to work uh, and your approach to work in those formative years. And in many cases, well, in fact, in all cases when it comes to addiction, is that any addictive behavior is designed to meet an emotional void. So what does that mean for, for people listening to this now? You probably got a sense of significance, a sense of affection, a sense of attention, or a sense of love from the people who you were looking for validation from uh, in those formative years. So the people that you cared about and and you know, cared about you, um, being rewarded, recognised for your work ethic was a way that you met your need for connection. And so unconsciously your brain went, oh, well, I like the way this feels when people say you're doing a good job. So the job then became do more of that job. And over time, you just dug yourself a deeper and deeper and deeper hole inside your workshop. A vicious cycle. Join our free Facebook group, Your Profitable Auto Repair Shop, and join in on the conversation with auto repair shop owners just like you globally. So what uh, is step four in the recovery process? So step four is to twist the knife, right? As if this wasn't... Uh, you know, maybe if you're listening uh, you know, right now, maybe it, uh, it feels pretty bad now, but now we want to twist the knife, right? We've just kind of stabbed you a couple of times, uh, woken you up, but now we want to twist the knife. And this is where you've got to think about your true legacy. In many cases, as a parent, you'll be thinking, well, and I say this as a parent, but maybe if you, if you haven't got kids listening to this, maybe you're looking at your, your team, your apprentices, uh, you know, and your, your newer team members. So on some level, you're thinking to yourself, well, you know what? I'm going to show them what a great work ethic is. I'm going to show them what hard work looks like. You know, they don't know what hard work was, should have seen what it was like when, uh, you know, I was doing my apprenticeship, what it was, you know, you know the differences that it was then. When we pair that back to the people closest to us, and again, as a dad of three kids, I think about the, you know, my three when I say this, um, while I was spending all this time under the misguided belief that I was leaving a legacy for them of, you know, what hard work looked like, the true legacy I was leaving was, Hey, Dad's never here. Dad's at work. Oh, Dad's doing that again. Oh, Dad said he'd be here, but he came home late. Now, understand that there is no perfect balance here, and there are times where, yeah, sure, you know, a bit of chaos ensues, and you need to stay around for a little bit. But if your default setting is to hang around at the workshop, not get home for, uh, you know, dinner time, bedtime, bath time, whatever it might be, or you're missing other, uh, uh, you know, school events, sporting events, social events, um, concerts, date night, date night, because you're um, uh, because you got you know one more job, um, then we know we've got a real issue. So what's step four? It's to consider the real legacy. I mean by that, you know, what's your partner's perspective on you staying at work all the time? What's your kid's perspective on you staying at work all the time? What's the true legacy you're actually going to be leaving behind if all you choose to do is work? work and work and that was a real eye-opener when we spoke to our clients about this um you know getting the uh, kids perspective and some of them had already been freely given their children's perspective and it was really sad to them to listen to their kids saying you are always at work i i didn't ask you to come with me to that event because you are always at work yeah, and it's interesting because that's where uh, a separation begins. You know, repeated requests from uh, you know your loved ones to uh, f- to have you join them at certain events, and because over time you prioritise work, they stop asking, mm. and then suddenly here's a communication breakdown. You know, well you didn't ask me. Well, you, when we did, you never turned up, and here's the anger, the frustration, the irritation created when two people have competing beliefs. Mm. You know, the workaholic feels like they're providing for their family, and those at home, you know, that, that, are, that are nurturing that loving, caring family environment, feel isolated, ostracised, separated. Um, both believe they're doing the right thing, inverted commas, mm. and yet what occurs is a breakdown of a relationship, breakdown of communication, and the impact that has on a business overall, and, and we've both experienced this, it can be you know, catastrophic. Mm. So step five, to finish us off here with our recovery process for workaholism. Yeah, well, step five should put a uh, smile on your face, uh, particularly when I share this example with you. But step five is you've got to make a deal with the devil. And what I mean by that is, um, I can remember um, in previous relationship, uh, quite often we'd end up with a lot of junk 
in our garage and you know we would um, devote a, you know a weekend to getting the junk out of the the, the garage uh, you know preparing to to get rid of it work out what to, you know what we needed what we didn't need clear out the clutter uh, and the junk and uh, just put the stuff that we needed back in but what would happen we'd take all the junk out We'd clean the garage, you know, get rid of the cobwebs, sweep the floor, do whatever we needed to do. The garage looked fantastic. We had a nice clean garage. And then we'd just put all of the stuff back in and we'd clear out none of the clutter. So when we talk about making a deal with the devil, that means you have to look at what are all the things that you're currently doing, i.e. saying yes to, that is keeping you locked inside your shop for hours and hours and hours on end. You've got to seriously list down, note down every single task that keeps you there. And then the deal with the devil is that you've got to make a decision on what you will not put back into your day. You know, The smallest task, the biggest tune-up, it doesn't matter what it is, you get to decide, but you must decide. You cannot keep doing all the same tasks. That is the true nature of addictive behavior where you justify your behavior because you get you know, you get a, a well it's a it's an impermanent positive emotional response to that behavior so you got to decide what needs to go and you need to be very very clear on whether you're going to dump it whether you're going to delegate it or whether you're going to delay doing it so that you actually give yourself time space and permission to get yourself out of your shop and home to your family and your loved ones now if if you are a workaholic listening to this is it something that you'd need accountability with to be successful to recover or do you think that most people once they realize they're a workaholic can tackle this well i guess the best way to to well straight up the answer is this you know every elite performer in the world has a coach and by coach i mean a partner who keeps them accountable for doing the work they need to do to improve the way they perform behave and live now does that need to be a paid professional coach not necessarily, but there are, uh, just like there are groups for uh, you know, AA, Alcoholics Anonymous, there are groups around the world called WA, Workaholics Anonymous. In extreme cases, if you need to join that group, join that group. Mm. Because most importantly, you need to understand you're not going through this alone. I say this as a re- recovering you know, workaholic. You're not going through it alone. There's other people that, that you know, have the same addiction the same affliction as you um but you're not broken um you you don't need fixing but some of the decision making um that you're currently employing needs some fine tuning to give you the freedom to say yes to you Mm. because every time you say yes to another car another customer you're actually saying no to other things in your life so to answer your question specifically a partner accountability coach whoever it is absolutely to, to help you stay on track and more importantly to help you see the signs of um, of regression into you know old addictive patterns someone that can point that out and say hey Rach you know that thing you do that got you here well it looks like you're starting to do that again mm. what else could we do yeah and it keeps you curious and focused on the patterns of behavior the decisions you make that will lead you to recovery from workaholism <laughs> Take a smoke out and review us on your Apple Podcast app or wherever you listen. We've discovered it's such a big thing and, you know, this is why we have training around it uh, for our engine room clients. And if you're out there listening and you realise that this is something you'd really like to overcome because uh, things have gotten way out of control uh, and you'd like to bring more harmony back into your life so that you are there for those important events with family and uh, and with your partner, then I encourage you, um, you know, to book in and have a chat with us to see if uh, we can help you with... Uh, what's going on for you and that's as simple as uh, going to the web address workshopwhisperer.com forward slash survey answering a couple of quick questions uh, and then you can book a time to chat Dean thanks so much for sharing that with us Uh, so insightful and I know that uh, that's going to be another really powerful episode uh, that our listeners will go back to time and again and likely share uh, with their other half after they've finished listening today so if you have a question about your auto repair shop that you would like answered then please email us admin at workshopwhisperer.com and we will answer your question on one of our next Workshop Whispers episodes. 
Thanks so much for listening and we look forward to being with you again next week. Want to find out how the Workshop Whisperer team can put your auto repair shop on the path to business success? Head to www.workshopwhisperer.com slash whisperingloudly to claim your free workshop success session with the team.